It's hard to think of an idyllic sunset or sunrise without that gorgeous sunburst that you get at high f-stops. But apart from that really delightful geometric shape, what's the purpose of incorporating a sunburst into the landscape in the first place? It tends to be overused, but the sunburst is a really great way to help draw interest to a specific subject in the composition or to draw attention to the fall and lay of the light on the landscape, thus helping the viewer's eye to wander through the image, as we've talked about in some previous vlogs. For this reason, it can be incredibly effective to position the sunburst in one of those upper corners. But one of my favorite ways to use the sunburst is as a counterbalance in an otherwise chilly sunrise or sunset photo. That overpowering warm light source tends to contrast and balance the dark chilly tones in a sunrise or sunset. But it's surprisingly difficult to create good sunburst images. Not every sunset or sunrise is going to have the necessary conditions and your camera settings and composition have to be spot on for the effect to work out. Once you get back to the editing room, the post-production process is stupidly time consuming for such a simple effect. So today I'm going to walk you guys through the process from shooting the image to post-production in Lightroom and Photoshop. Now remember, the sunburst becomes one of the subjects in your composition, so it needs to follow the compositional rules. Adding a sunburst just because the conditions are right can probably make your image worse off. The number one ingredient you're going to need is a small light source. Just shooting into the sun won't necessarily produce the sunburst effect. For the effect to be visible, you need a bright point light source, in other words, the sun, in the midst of a darker region. And the sky around the sun needs to be crystal clear to make a crisp sunburst. Preferably, the sun needs to be close to something dark from your point of view so those spikes stand out. I would recommend making sure there aren't any clouds spreading out or diffusing the sun's light. The smaller the light source is to your camera, the crisper those spikes will be. A really great trick you can do is to find some foreground, maybe a rock or tree branches or the ridge of a mountain, and position yourself to shrink the sun to a smaller point. In this image from Oregon, I walked around the beach until the sun was nearly cut off by these rocks in the foreground. So even though the sun isn't exactly a point light source, it was smaller to my camera, smaller enough to get this effect. So once you've decided on the composition and where you wanna position the sunburst and you've gotten it small enough, now you need to shoot at F14, aperture stop 14 or higher to get that really pronounced sunburst. F16 has been my sweet spot, but at that point, any dirt or salt spray on the lens pops right out. So you really need to make sure that your lens and filters are spotless. Don't shoot beyond F19. At that point, diffraction is gonna start softening the image and it won't really improve the shape of the sunburst. So F16 has really been my sweet spot. I even sometimes get a really nice sunburst at F11. Next, you're going to want to shoot with the right lens. You can get this effect with pretty much any lens, but some lenses won't produce nearly as nice looking of a sunburst. To get a sunburst with several crisp spikes, you want to shoot with a lens that has an odd number of aperture blades. This is something that you can find when you're looking at the technical specs for your lenses. For example, Canon's 16 to 35 millimeter lens has nine aperture blades. That will produce 18 spikes. Any lens with an odd number of blades will produce twice as many spikes as there are blades, whereas lenses with an even number of blades will produce just that many spikes. So a six blade aperture will only produce six spikes. Now because the exposure difference between your landscape, the sunburst, and the sky is going to be so astronomically different, those spikes will probably be washed out along with an overly lit sky. So you'll need at least two exposures, probably three. You'll need one exposure that covers the majority of the landscape, you'll need one for the sky, and one for the center of the starburst. Basically, you're going to be producing a high dynamic range image, and it's not gonna look gaudy like a lot of the HDR images you might be used to seeing. It's just we need that extra dynamic range to be able to combine these different exposures together. So I don't recommend using your camera's HDR feature if it has one. Instead, you want to manually bracket and set each exposure to get exactly the landscape at its best, the sky and the center of the starburst. So take time to get those settings right. Don't go with the auto HDR feature. It's gonna give you a little bit more work in post if you didn't get it just right. And last, and this is really important, you must use a tripod for these exposures. 
When bracketing exposures or doing high dynamic range photography, it's not usually a big deal to handhold for these back-to-back -back exposures, but unfortunately, the slightest shift to the camera will change the shape and orientation of the sunburst and that flare you get with it, which is gonna make it really time consuming to merge. So absolutely shoot with a tripod. I've made this mistake more times than I can count. I was lazy and I just shot back-to-back -back exposures, even the slightest shift, the slightest rotation will completely change the position of the flare. Now at this point, we have pretty much all the ingredients we need to shoot some great sunbursts, but sunbursts tend to have a major drawback, and that is the presence of lens flare. So lens flares, it sometimes kind of looks pretty stylistic, it's kind of nostalgic. Flare on the landscape exposure, however, is problematic. It can be stylish, but what it does is it washes out colors and details. It's kind of like a colored haze. And if you go to the trouble of waiting for the best light of the day, you really don't want to spoil your incredible landscape with that cheapy flare look. Unfortunately, sunbursts and flare are a package deal. You can't really have one without the other. But here's a really awesome trick to get the sunburst without the flare. Go ahead and snap your sky and sunburst exposure first, and then when you go to snap the landscape exposure, take one of your fingers and while you're looking through the viewfinder, try to block out the sun. Now, you want to block out as little as possible because otherwise you're gonna have a lot of masking to do. So I typically come from the top of the image or um, I stick my hand over the lens and come over the top and try to block out just the sun without coming too far down. What this will do is your landscape exposure won't have any flare or sunburst, so you'll get all your beautiful colors in the landscape. And then later in post, what we'll do is we'll combine these different exposures. We'll have the landscape exposure, and then we'll brush in just the sunburst from the sunburst exposure and then the sky. So now we'll have sunbursts on top of our landscape exposure, which didn't have any flare, so we have all the best colors of the landscape. So now that you've captured these exposures, you need to combine them. Unfortunately, that's a bit of a beast. So we'll pick up next week with a non-destructive Lightroom and Photoshop workflow. In the meantime, go outside and practice shooting some sunbursts. I messed up entire shoots getting my technique right, so it's definitely preferable to practice before you head out on your next in earnest shoot. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for the latest digital nomad tips, landscape photography tutorials, and on-location vlogs.